Warner Brothers legal department waited until the night before our screening to send us a letter uh, basically saying they, they didn't agree that the film fell under parody and that we shouldn't screen it. Hi, my name is Peter Kinnett, and I am here with Vera Drew, the filmmaker of the movie The People's Joker. I'm not a hero, and I'm not a villain either. So who are you? I'm a woman of my word. <laughs> I have so much that I want to talk to you about this incredible film, The People's Joker, which you wrote, edited, directed, and star in, which, you know, is not only an incredible and bold feat of, of storytelling and cultural critique, but the stories behind not only how you made it, but now how you're getting it out into the world are pretty wild. Um, but I kind of want to just go back to start with your sort of origin story as an artist. Uh, you sort of got your start in comedy. Yeah, I started doing comedy like at what I would describe as like a way too young age. Like I was like 13 uh, and really got into improv. And I really threw myself at comedy when I was a kid because I kind of just didn't have anything else like it really felt like this beautiful space for me to like play and explore it was a, pl a place for me to like play with like gender boundaries and stuff like that like it's kind of how I got into drag and stuff was doing comedy I kind of had always wanted to make a big piece of art that was sort of processing how comedy can both like really be this like beautiful playground for identity and exploration and can kind of be this like toxic drug that you're sort of addicted to if you're not, you know, being honest with yourself. Yeah, and this film is like a very insightful uh, piece of work in terms of like the way that it talks about comedy in various forms. But I want to also, just before we get into that, the sort of catalyst for you making this film, from what I understand, but please correct me, is that someone sort of basically dared you to re-edit Todd Phillips' Joker. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was technically it was technically an artistic commission. Okay. It was the only art commission I've ever gotten in my life. Um, and it was only $12 because it was um, just between friends. Brie, who co-wrote the film. Yeah, yes. Brie LaRose, who was a writer on Lady Dynamite and uh, the Arrested Development, like recent seasons of Arrested Development. I was kind of looking to get into like a big, weird artistic thing that I could sort of throw myself in. And it was uh, right around the time where Todd Phillips, director of uh, Joker 2019, he was complaining about how like it's too hard or whatever to do comedy now because I guess Zoomers and trans people are too offended or whatever. So Brie and I were like naturally like, that's bullshit because we're two of the rudest, funniest people we know. And like, we're both extremely gay. So like, let's, make a parody of of his art and making like kind of just like the rudest most colorful gayest superhero movie ever made before going jokeman to harlequin so to speak i wasn't even sure i existed it's like blurry cracked mosaic of all these gender revelations you mean she's a he I'm trans. Oh, uh, oh, uh, well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. And you worked with like a hundred plus artists to do this. Like, I am really curious about what this process was to bring this together, because to me, it just seems just extraordinary. Like what had to happen for this film to come together? It's really crazy, honestly, to kind of think about, because when Brie and I started it, it really was just like a remix. It was gonna be just kind of a remix video of like a feature length remix of Todd Phillips Joker. Kind of like everything is terrible or like other, like, you know, found footage um, style, but like feature length and would be exploring queerness and, and all this stuff. But when we started like actually writing it and putting it together, we were like, let's just make a movie and like, let's find a way to do it that is like protected by fair use and parody. I'd worked on like a lot of really cool stuff in my career and it was like the thing of any time I would try to go off and do my own thing and strike out on my own, like I would get a little bit of following and a little bit of traction, but all my stuff was very like aggressively gay and, and would break form a lot and not always good too. So like I was kind of used to just announcing things like this and having it just die. And 
the response was like overwhelming. Like we had hundreds of people, artists, animators, actors, other directors, a lot of editors, um, a lot of lawyers as well, uh, reach out and were like, yeah, let's, let's all make a gay Batman movie together. And thank you for asking about like that part of the process, just cause like it kind of does get really lost in the story and all the drama of it all. Like we weren't trying to make a movie that like we premiered at TIFF and then got in, you know, to all the legal kerfuffle we got into. Like we were just all trying to make art together and yeah. be friends. And it really was kind of grounded in this like collaborative thing. And, and it was cool just cause everybody was super talented and it became very easy to go like, okay, this is like a mixed media movie now. Like we're gonna have every kind of animation style. It could all completely blow up in my face and not work, but it'll probably be a lot of fun. And you know, the movie's very like painstakingly autobiographical. Like it's really, really based on my life to the degree that like I've had to stop watching it. <laughs> um, and like, it always was this thing of like, I can really just trust and lean in to all these people and not be like a megalomaniac or not like be a Stanley Kubrick about it and like really dictate every sure. single frame. I mean, like I did a lot of visual effects and a lot of art for the movie myself. And, but like, you know, when we'd get stuff from artists, it was like, even if it was like, okay, this isn't what was in my head, we'd make it work. Like it was just like, this is, this is the spirit of the project and my story and the specificity of my story and my identity, like my dumb face is gonna be on the screen for most of the movie. I'm not going anywhere, so I can kind of put my ego aside and kind of just like, honestly, for once, like really feel a sense of like queer community around me and my art and um, yeah, just trust that it's gonna like all come together. Foretold that someday a clown would rise. Sounds pretentious. It is. Whatever you say, Mr. J. Hunka hunka. Well, I mean, now that you're you're getting to show it to audiences, that sense of community must be coming out in a different way. Because I mean, it's it seems above all else a trans coming of age story, a beautifully rendered one and deeply moving one at that. So I'm sure that people are being people are feeling seen by this movie in, in pretty profound ways. Like, what's your experience been like sort of witnessing that now that you finally do get to show it to people? Gosh, um, really intense. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it really, you know, there's definitely that contingent of the of people that, like, it's really speaking to. But, like, yeah, the response has been very overwhelming and people are really affected by it. I've had a lot of people come out to me after screenings. Oh, yeah as trans or, or, you know, just as queer or like as questioning. And it's felt very intense, but it's also felt just like this beautiful, like gift to come out of this. Like I never could have fathomed that I would make a piece of art that would resonate like this with people. And that it would also be the first feature film I ever made. The response to the movies really validated for me that like the trans experience, the queer experience, like coming out, like it is no different than any other like coming of age experience that people have. Like everybody kind of reaches a point in their life where they do have to like kind of confront their authenticity and sort of gut check that. And, you know, trans people, like a lot of us do that externally and like change our bodies and our appearances and our presentations and stuff. And like, but everybody goes through that. And it, it, it's cool. Cause it's like, it's shown me like, okay, my experience, as like a wildly gay trans woman can can resonate with somebody who is seemingly has nothing in common with me. And we should talk about uh, its premiere, which happened here. Is this your first time back in Toronto since then? Yes, okay. yeah, it is. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's been very healing. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, like it screened at the Toronto Film Festival, had its world premiere in 2022, um, screened once, and then for a complicated array of reasons, was was pulled from the festival. Were you nervous at that point? I mean, first of all, it's, just tell me a little bit about how that all felt. But were you nervous that it was, wasn't going to get seen? Yeah, I mean, Warner Brothers legal department waited until the night before our screening to send us a letter uh, basically saying they, they didn't agree that the film fell under parody and that we shouldn't screen it. Um, and that was kind of it. And thankfully, TIFF went to bat for us and spent that whole day, uh, the day of our premiere, um, 
trying to get through to Warner Brothers. They eventually got through to the head of Warner Brothers Canada, I think. And basically we're like, look, like you guys waited until the night before to do this. We have a theater, like we have a small army of like angry anarchist queer people who wanted to see this movie. And if you take that away from them, like you can, but like, we're just making you aware of like where we're at with this. And we had that premiere and it was honestly one of the best nights of my life. Like it, it really, it was so magical. It was my favorite screening ever. Um, every joke was landing, people were dancing. It was, it was so clear that I had made something beautiful and with my friends and didn't make it at the expense of anybody or like exploitat exploitatively. Like it was just this beautiful, pure love night. And then ended up, you know, we were supposed to have a whole festival run after TIFF, but I was so overwhelmed. It was my choice to then pull the movie from our subsequent festi film festivals. And, you know, we were doing these secret screenings, but the day of every screening, I would go on Twitter and say, hey, Melbourne, or hey, Brisbane, or hey, Sydney, I'm, I'm, I'm in your city and like I'm screening a movie tonight. It's not the people's joker, or it's something. Come see what it is. And people would know what it was. So we were kind of loudly doing this, this secret tour. <laughs> And that really got me to a place where I was like, I'm ready to get this back out there and to start like publicly screening it again. Like, let's do it. And thankfully, you know, a lot of cool people at Outfest were able to convince their like stuffy anti-labor bosses like, hey, we should uh, screen this like crazy leftist Joker parody. And we, we got to have our US premiere in LA. And that festival is sponsored by Warner Brothers Discovery. So there are pictures of me on the red carpet uh, for that premiere. That's under beautiful. The, yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and it all kind of worked out. And, and yeah, now we've just kind of been doing our, our little festival run. And it feels really good to not be like lurking in the shadows as much anymore with it. Like I've talked to way too many lawyers <laughs> in the last year. All of them agree this film is 100% protected by parody and fair use, like the only thing that really separates the people's Joker from something like Scary Movie or The Naked Gun or like any of these kinds of movies is that it's a very deeply personal queer trans coming of age story. I mean, it's... The Naked Gun is that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in many ways, yes, you're, you're, you're quite right. Well, I mean, I can certainly understand how this has been a wildly overwhelming two years, year and a half for you, like even with the stuff leading up to the first film festival. I'm, and I'm really glad to hear that these programmers came to bat for you, these fans came to bat for you, and that you were allowed to like take, it seems like a lot of joy out of a lot of these experiences too, despite it being, you know, an incredibly stressful situation. Completely, like I can't stress enough how joyful it's been. Like before making this movie, I, I knew like three trans people that I, I think I could have considered my friends. And it's connected me, me with my community, finally, in this, in this really beautiful way. Well, I mean, I hope a lot more films are made like this, too. I feel like it's, it's a really interesting reinvention of, of queer cinema in so many ways. And I hope that everybody who wants to see it gets to see it. It really seems like they're going to. And I wish you the best on your continued journey with this film. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and truly honored you asked and, and this was great and I love your hoodie by the way. I, I wanted to wear like my own sort of queer cinematic supervillain. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no. He's also like a gatekeeper too and I feel like this film has a lot to say about gatekeeping so yeah. Oh yeah, no, Tar is a little triggering for me to watch but yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 again, tone complimentary. <laughs> yeah, and I made this myself so I feel like this is the closest I'm ever going to come to making my version of the People's Jokers. I made a sweater about <laughs> a cinematic supervillain. Hey, we all, we all pick our victories and, and I'm glad you got yours. Well, I'm glad you're getting yours too and yeah, thanks so much. Three, two, one.